So first off, during the prayer, thank you. The prayer mentioned like being open to listening. And when I've heard about these disciplinary courts in the past, people turn to pretend to put their heads down and not pay attention. And I just ask that you give me 60 minutes of listening. And when you're, and when we're done, if, if you feel like I'm, I'm an apostate, great, then excommunicate me and, and so be it. Um, but I hope we go listen because my story in some ways is your story. So when I was uh, 17 years old, I found the church. And it was the most beautiful thing in the world. I was using drugs. I was making bad choices. I was shoplifting. And I discovered Mormonism. And it was gorgeous. And it was like it picked me up off of one path and it set me down on another. And it changed my life. So I'm a 17-year-old kid and I joined the church. And I'm committed. I'm both feet in. Um, first calling I served in was an assistant ward mission leader. Then I was a secretary in the Elders Court Presidency immediately following. I was a counselor in the Elders Court Presidency. I was the Elders Court President. I was a bishop or a, a counselor in the bishopric. And by 29 years old, I served as a bishop in the Sanusky Ward in Ohio, a Midwestern ward, about 120 attending, um, small ward, and good people. And, and the trouble is that when we're in a religious system, we, we struggle to recognize if our system has any issues because we tend to listen to the authorities of our tribe. And we're skeptical of anything that comes from outside our tribe. And so tonight I hope to share with you a little bit of our history so you can understand where I'm coming from. And then once I've said my piece, feel free to, again, do whatever needs to be done. Um, when I was 32 years old, I was halfway through serving as a bishop and I had a faith crisis. And my faith crisis came because from the time I was 17 until that 32 years old, I was reading everything about Mormonism. I was reading about its history from faithful sources. I was reading from critical sources. I was going back to the original source material. And I simply wanted to know Mormonism inside and out. And as I started to discover some issues, um, I, I found faithful answers that worked, but they only worked if you understood the issue at a surface level. And then once you understood the issue, you realized it became way more complicated than the church let on it being. So let me share a couple of things. First, we like to talk about Joseph Smith dabbled in treasure digging. And most of us in this room maybe don't even know what that is. Joseph Smith in 1819, and, and again, I, I don't want you to take my word for it. If something I say tonight makes you uncomfortable, go look it up. Go to the original sources, read both sides, and make up your own mind. In 1819, a year before the first vision, Joseph Smith is 13 years old, and he borrows a seer stone from Sally Chase. Sally Chase is a town scryer. She takes her stone, she looks at it, and she tells other people in the town where their lost items are, okay? In 1819, Joseph borrows that stone, he looks into it, and he's told where his own seer stone is. And he's told it's 150 miles away, that's what he alleges. So he disappears, he comes back, and now he has a white translucent stone. Uh, in 1823, while digging a well on the Willard Chase property, he finds a second stone. It's the one the church has recently talked about, egg-shaped. The church has had that stone in its possession all along. But my gut tells me if we went around the room and we talked about what story each of you grew up with in terms of the Book of Mormon translation, each of you would say there were Nephite spectacles buried in a box, and that's what Joseph Smith used. The church only recently, because we live in an internet age, feels compelled to now tell us a fuller story. That stone was in their possession, was used to bless the Manti Temple. So in 18, uh, 20, sorry, 1823, he gets that second seer stone. A money digger in, or a treasure digger is somebody who claims to know where buried treasures are. Joseph Smith would get people in the town to pay him money. He would take his seer stone, put it in a hat, bury his face into it, excluding all light, and then he would tell people where Spanish treasure was buried. The trouble was he never found it. He'd get paid, he'd tell them where to dig, and as they dug a hole, he would say, oh, it flipped further into the earth. It's gone. He scammed people. And we don't want to hear that because we like to set our prophet up on a pedestal. But it's more than that. When you understand treasure digging, you understand that Joseph Smith told people that there was buried treasure in hills protected by guardian spirits using a seer stone, which also represents, too, a similar story, right? Moroni in the gold plates buried in a hill. Moroni is a guardian spirit and he uses a seer stone. We don't talk about that history because it's not faith promoting. The first vision. My guess is if I went around the room, we all know the story. During this time of great excitement, my mind was called up to serious reflection, a great uneasiness. And though my feelings were deep and often poignant, 
still, I kept myself aloof from the various parties. We know the story. We taught it on our missions, right? Here's the trouble, though. There are four accounts of the first vision. The earliest one was written in 1832 in Joseph Smith's personal journal, written by his own hand. In that journal, he writes down that he went only to have his sins forgiven. And when he talks about being visited by supreme beings, he only mentions Jesus Christ. There was no heavenly father. His own handwriting. Our own scholars, when talking about the 1838 account that we use as the official account, our own scholars, Richard Bushman, if anybody knows that name, Richard Bushman says that account is most likely written by Sidney Rigdon or George Robinson, who were scribes of Joseph Smith. It's not his language. It's not the way Joseph wrote things. So we pulled one story that's written much later, not in Joseph's writing, and we ignore a story that's much different that comes in 1832. And the trouble is in Mormonism, we stand up and we bear testimony of things. We bear testimony that we know on a spring morning in a grove of trees that Joseph Smith prayed and he was visited by God the Father and his son Jesus. But that's not the 1832 account. But again, we don't know that. Here's why. Joseph Fielding Smith was called as church historian in 1921. Sometime between 1921 and 1940, Joseph Fielding Smith cut that 1832 account out of Joseph's personal journal with a penknife and stored it away in a church vault in the church historian's office. And he referred to it as a peculiar first vision, and he mentioned it to very few people. He didn't want us to know it. Now, you can go on today and see it because in 1965, Joseph Fielding Smith, the rumor got out, and Gerald and Sandra Tanner, who were critics of the church, started to go public with the fact that there was this other first vision account. But what does he do? He takes it out of the church vault, he gets some tape, and he tapes it back into Joseph Smith's journal. You can go on LDS.org today, and you can look at that 1832 account. It is taped back, back in. You can see the cellophane tape there that places it back in the Joseph's journal. The Book of Mormon translation, again, each of us grew up being told about Nephite and uh, spectacles, the, the Urim and Thummim, buried in a box, but that's not the story. And the reason the church didn't want to tell us about seer stones was because once we know there's stones involved instead of the spectacle, the next logical question is where do those stones come from? And now we're back to talking about treasure digging and Joseph duping people for money. Um, a scholar, Dan Bogle, wrote an article that points to 17 different treasure digs in the Palmyra area. Uh, here's another detail. We're not talking about just a six-foot deep hole in the ground. We're talking about essentially digging out a cave into a mound of earth, having a dozen people work for days on end, digging a hole, thinking they're going to get a treasure and having paid to find it only to be told it doesn't exist. My guess is none of you, or very few of you, have heard those stories. We have passing quotes in Mormonism. We like to say things like, uh, these, the, the quote from Joseph himself, that uh, it wasn't a very uh, uh, financially beneficial endeavor. He got paid 14 months a month or $14 a month, and he gave it up quickly. That's not true. He, he was a treasure digger for years. And these things involve folk magic and magic circles and cutting dogs' throats and sheep's throats. But again, none of us are told that story. I wasn't told that story. It was only by reading and diving into the sources and looking at journal entries from church members as well as critics where those things are talked about. Brigham Young himself talks about seer stones and Joseph's treasure digging. So we have this story of the Book of Mormon translation. And the whole time the church has got that stone in the vault, but they don't want you to know about it. And it's only until we live in an internet age where they see members left and right coming across this information that they are now saying like, oh, we have to talk about it because people are leaving. People are finding this stuff and they're leaving. Yeah. The Book of Mormon itself, I love the Book of Mormon. I still look through its pages. But here's the problem. It contains a lot of 19th century material. Phrases, sermons, geographic locations close to Joseph Smith's own home. Stories, um, let me give you one quote, and I'm sorry, I'm getting a little nervous. So Richard Bushman, this is a scholar, faithful scholar, holds the office of church patriarch. He says, translating the book without the plates, even in sight, wrapped up in a cloth. Again, notice too, we have pictures, we have artwork on our wall that shows Joseph using the and Thummim and looking at the plates and translating. That's not true. The plates weren't in sight or they were covered up with a cloth. Joseph put a stone in a hat buried his face into it, excluded all the light, and then dictated the Book of Mormon. Bushman says, translating the book without plates even in sight, wrapped up in a cloth on the table, 
It's not something that comes right off the pages. That is the characters on the plates. So we don't know how that works. And then there's the fact that there's phrasing everywhere, long phrases, that if you Google them, you find them in 19th century writings. The theology of the Book of Mormon is very much 19th century theology. And it reads like 19th century understanding of the Hebrew Bible, as an Old Testament that is. It has Christ in it, the way Protestants saw Christ everywhere in the Old Testament. And there's other translation productions. There's the Book of Abraham. We were all told a story about a man who went through Kirtland, Ohio, who had papyri and mummies, and the church bought those. And Joseph told us that those were the writings of Abraham written by his own hand. That papyri was lost, except in, 19, in the 1960s, that papyri surfaced again. We thought it was lost in the great Chicago fire. It wasn't. Another museum had it. The church bought it. The trouble was now, even our church Egyptologists, when they read it and look at it, we now know what Egyptian translates into because of the Rosetta Stone. The Book of Abraham papyri does not translate into the Book of Abraham. It is a standard Egyptian common funeral text that has nothing to do with Abraham. It's not the writings of Abraham. It's not written, written by his own hand. The facsimiles that we have in our scriptures, those facsimiles, Joseph named every single picture on those facsimiles. Every single one of those Egyptologists acknowledge they're all wrong. He didn't get the translation correct. So now what we've done is we've come up with a new theory, and that theory is called the catalyst theory. And we say that the book of the papyri is not the book of Abraham, but it it prompted Joseph to, to essentially receive this story, even though he thought it was on the papyri. But do you see the trick there? We walked it back to a place where neither one is discernible as an outsider. We've essentially moved the story to a place where whether it's a fraud or whether it's real scripture, it comes out of Joseph's head either way. And there's no way to discern as an outsider. We're no longer teaching the story that each of you grew up with. The book of Moses. The book of Moses contains exact phrases and sentences and sentence structures from Luke chapter 4 and Matthew chapter 4. Now, that book was written before the New Testament. In other words, it's anachronism. It, it would be like if I had a painting on the wall, or a photograph, I should say, on the wall, of Abraham Lincoln holding an iPhone. It's out of place. The book of Moses contains New Testament sentence structure that is not, shouldn't be there. It doesn't belong there. The Joseph Smith translation, BYU itself just released studies where Haley Lamont, who's a student, and Thomas Wayman, who is a professor, acknowledged that while we were taught that the Joseph Smith translation was a restoration of the Bible that had been lost or corrupted, our own scholars at BYU now acknowledge it was a direct borrowing, which means plagiarism, from a contemporary source, Adam Clark's commentary. BYU acknowledges that long phrases and paragraphs come straight out of a book that was accessible to Joseph Smith in his own day. This only makes sense if you're willing to make drastic shifts in your beliefs. Again, the story we were raised with, I was raised with, and each of you doesn't hold up. The last Joseph Smith translation production is called the Kinderhook Plates. There were a couple of people who wanted to deceive the prophet Joseph Smith. They created really small bell-shaped plates they etched them with acid, making them look old, buried them in the ground, and then went and got a Latter-day Saint to help them dig, saying, let's go find something. And what do they find? They find these plates that they buried. They take them to the prophet Joseph Smith, and he actually begins translating them, translating two or three sentences from the Kendrick plates before, for whatever reason, he quits. So there's, there's some of the early Mormon history. What about polygamy? How many of you were raised thinking that Joseph Smith was a monogamous? How many of you knew that he had married 14, 15, 16-year-old girls? And we like to say that oh, marriage was different back then. That's not true. That's the argument we come up with. But when we actually look at the data on marriages, they're not much different than what the ages are today of males and females being married. Also, when a young girl did get married in that day, it was a young girl and a young guy. So you'd have a 14-year-old and a 19-year-old. But what we find in early Mormonism is 14-year-olds and 57-year-olds. And brethren, Fanny Elger was Joseph Smith's first intimate relationship away from Emma. Emma didn't know about it. If you go to LDS.org, there are gospel topic essays 
The essay on polygamy, you have to read, you have to click read more. It'll open up further. Then it's going to ask you if you want to read more about it. You have to click extra links. It sends you to an essay titled Polygamy in Kutland and Nauvoo. When you read that essay, it acknowledges that Fanny Elder was a maid in the Smith home. Emma didn't even know about her. And Joseph had an intimate relationship with her, 14 years old. The, uh, another story, Lucy Walker, she's 15 years old. Again, I want you to picture for you guys who have daughters. I have two daughters. Picture for a moment, you have daughters. The Lucy Walker, her mother dies. Joseph Smith comes to her and sends her father on a mission, promising to take care of his kids as his own. So Joseph Smith sent Lucy Walker's father on a mission, promises to take care of his kids, the Walker kids, as his own children. He even goes out into public, and Lucy writes in her journal, again, these are their journals, not me just taking a critic's words. Lucy Walker says, when we went out into public, he referred to us as his own children. But when she turned 16, Joseph also proposed to her to be a plural wife of his. My guess is not a single one of you have heard of Lucy Walker. Think about that for a moment, the predicament that puts you in. You either have to accept that Heavenly Father is the kind of God who is okay taking a father-daughter relationship and making it a husband-wife relationship. Now, I'm hoping that sits really uncomfortable with you, because it should. A 16-year-old girl living in the Smith home, propositioned by Joseph Smith, again, without Emma Smith's knowledge. And by the way, the LDF.org essay acknowledges that Emma did not know about many of these relationships. The Partridge sisters were another set of sisters who lived in the Smith home. Uh, they were 19 and 22. Joseph propositioned them without Emma's knowledge and got himself sealed to them and had an intimate relationship with them without either one of them knowing about each other and without Emma knowing about them. And soon after, Emma finally gave permission for Joseph to enter a plural marriage. And then Joe, Emma suggests that he be sealed to these Partridge sisters, but unbeknownst to her, he had already done that. So what does he do? He holds a second mock sealing in order for her to think it's the first one. Is that fidelity, brethren? Is that what you would do to your wives? Is marry other women behind your wives' backs without your wives knowing and have second marriage ceremonies without your wife even knowing that that had occurred? The Lawrence sisters were another young couple, or a young set of sisters, uh, 16 and I believe 17. They also worked in the Smith home and were wives of the prophet Joseph Smith. Mary Elizabeth Rawlings Leitner is a young lady who goes out when the Book of Commandments are being, uh, the press is being destroyed and they're blowing all around and she saves them in her dress. And we're told that story in our manuals. The story we don't tell is that Joseph propositioned her at 12 years old. They ended up, she ended up being a poor wife of Joseph years later. Joseph had at least 34 wives, most of which were young teenage girls or women already married to other men, which is called polyandry. Again, the LDS.org essay on the church's website acknowledges that. Emma was the 23rd wife sealed to Joseph Smith, not the first, the 23rd. Now, I get it. He's the prophet of our faith. But are you comfortable with that kind of fidelity? Melchizedek priesthood restoration, Peter, James, and John, Richard Bushman, again, a faithful, active scholar in the church, acknowledges that the information on Peter, James, and John comes so late in church history that it is totally acceptable to be believed to be a later fabrication. David Whitmer himself writes that Peter, James, and John come, those stories about that priesthood restoration come way late in the timeline. It's not, nobody's talking about it when it happens. And I like, we like the story of it's too sacred. That's not what's going on. The very witnesses of the Book of Mormon don't hear these stories. Oliver Cowdery does. From Joseph, he's saying he knows it. He's not telling anybody. We don't get any public record of these stories being shared. But again, Peter, James, and John show up way late in the story. Grace in the priesthood. George Albert Smith, from Brigham Young from 1852 to 1978 with Spencer W. Kimball, our church taught that those of color were less valiant in the pre-mortal life and that they carried the curse of Cain. We, in, on, a, on a multitude of occasions, including first presidency letters in 1940, 
48 or 49, as well as 1962 or 63, we declare that those things are doctrine. So you have one prophet who says, I know the mind and will of God, that those of color were less valiant and were cursed from the preexistent. Today, if you go to the LDS.org gospel topic essay, today's leaders disavow those doctrines and call them disavowed theory. So we went from having one prophet know for sure one thing to having a later prophet say he was wrong. So once you make that leap, you have to recognize that prophets can be deeply wrong on very important things, even the very foundational doctrines of the church. Brigham Young taught what was called the Adam-God doctrine, where Brigham Young taught that Adam was our heavenly father and that Elohim was our heavenly grandfather. Later on, Bruce R. McConkie and Spencer W. Kimball disavowed those doctrines. Those, that doctrine of the Adam-God was caught at the veil at the St. George Temple. It was part of the presentation at the veil. It was official doctrine of the church taught by a prophet of God and then disavowed by later prophets. So if the Holy Ghost is effective, then how can one prophet be adamant that ABC is true, only to have 50 years later another prophet say it's completely false? Lamanite DNA. In the LDS.org Gospel Topic Essay, the church recently acknowledged that all Native American, there is no Jewish DNA that is in the right timeline. In other words, it shows up in Native Americans at the right part where the Jaredites show up or where the Nephites show up. The church essentially says there's no way anymore to know who's a Lamanite and who's not. We used to go around and anybody who had tan skin, whether they were a Polynesian, whether they lived in Mexico, whether they lived in South America, didn't matter. We called them a Lamanite. It's a day the church acknowledges that we no longer know who's a Lamanite and who's not because the DNA isn't there. So the very people that we propose the Book of Mormon is written to, the Lamanites, we no longer know who to give the book to and say, you're a Lamanite. Again, our doctrines are changing drastically, and they're doing it in a way that you're not even aware that it's happening unless you're paying attention and you're reading away from just the correlated sources that you get in three-hour block. But go read the gospel topic essays. See if they make you nervous in terms of the teachings you each grew up with in Mormonism, and see if the things in those essays match up with the story you were told growing up. Handicapped kids. We were all raised in the church believing that those who were handicapped were the most valiant of our Heavenly Father's spirits. But here's what Harold B. Lee taught. He said, this privilege of obtaining a mortal body on this earth is seemingly so priceless that those in the spirit world, even though unfaithful or not valiant, were undoubtedly permitted to take mortal bodies, although under the penalty of racial, physical, or nationalistic limitations. Do you see that shift? We used to teach that handicapped kids were the least valiant in the pre-mortal life. Does anybody here have a handicapped child? Can you imagine being a parent of a kid and having you, the prophet of the Lord teach that your kid was the least valiant of the spirits in the spirit world? That's atrocious. So which is it, brethren? Is it one prophet who says they're the most valiant? Or is it another prophet who says they're the least? What about prophets themselves? We read the Old Testament, we read about Jesus in the New Testament, and we see miracles left and right. On my podcast, I once asked if there's anybody out there who's had a finger cut off and born without an arm, had an ear cut off, had lost their eyesight, and got a blessing to have those things restored, to come forward, I'd love to hear their story. If we're honest with ourselves, when I say God magic, there are no of those great supernatural miracles anymore. We all say, yeah, you know, my daughter had the flu and I gave her a blessing and it went away. But there there aren't the great miracles of, of the biblical times anymore. And yet we live in an age of verifiable history. You see, the moment there became a media and newspapers and journal and now smartphones and the internet, Heavenly Father seemed to have reduced significantly, almost to nothing, his ability to send fires down from heaven in order to uh, turn someone into salt for turning back and looking at a city, to part scene, to put manna on the ground. 
those things, if we're honest, those kinds of miracles don't happen today. In the Book of Mormon, we, we have our prophets who raise a hand or say word and smite a critic dumb for three days or smite them deaf for three days. But my gut tells me that we all understand that nobody could raise a hand today and strike a critic dumb for three days or deaf. Those things are gone. So your only option is to look at those stories and say, I wonder if they're embellished. I wonder if they're myth. I wonder if those stories, why, why did those stories happen that way then? And now in an age of verifiable history, those things don't happen that way anymore. You can't restore limbs. Even though Jesus restored him here, we don't have stories anymore of limbs restored. We have some people who get healed from cancer. We have others who die. That's just human nature. That's just the way it works. I want to finish in terms of uh, talking about a little bit of the unhealthiness of the church, but I want to bridge it with this. When I talk about the messiness of our history, when I talk about the messiness of our history, there's a thousand more data points where our story gets off. But what we, what I did, and what I'm guessing each of you do, is say that doesn't matter. For the real end, doesn't matter. I've had some sacred experiences. I've felt the spirit, but here's the trick. In the end, Latter-day Saints dismiss things that people like me say because it doesn't matter. We've had these experiences. I understand that. I've had deeply profound experiences too. When I served as a bishop, I had incredible experiences that were spiritual in nature. The trouble is people of all faith have spiritual experiences. And people of all faiths re receive reassurances that their truth claims of their religious system are just as true as the answers that we get about ours. The other thing we run into is a thing called elevation emotion. Mormonism imposes that the Holy Ghost is a burning in the bosom, a peaceful feeling, an increased love for goodness and truth. The problem is in psychology, we have a better explanation. It's called elevation emotion. Elevation emotion is an emotion elicited by witnessing virtuous acts of remarkable moral goodness. It is experienced as a distinct feeling of warmth and expansion that is accompanied by appreciation and affection for the individual whose exceptional conduct is being observed. You see, this happens to everyone. It has nothing to do with truth. They can actually take people and lie to them. But if the person being lied to perceives a virtuous act taking place, they feel warm in their chest. They feel an expansion in their body, and they are drawn towards goodness in the world. Everybody who's a human being experiences that. But as Mormon, we've monopolized it. We've said, no, that's only here. We have the Holy Ghost. And I get it. We like to say, yeah, other people feel the Holy Ghost too. The trouble is there, everybody, us and them, are feeling this feeling around true things and false things. So if the Holy Ghost is dependable, that shouldn't be the case. Now I want to talk a little bit about the unhealthiness that's in our church. First in this room, so I've spent 20 years reading everything. I've interviewed our scholars. I've talked to authors of historical books in Mormonism. I've talked to Richard Bushman. I've talked to Terrell Gibbons. I've spoken to Adam Miller. And I don't know if these names even ring a bell with you, but these are the best scholars we have. Patrick Mason. Um, I've spoken to Elder Holland face-to-face. -face. I've spoken to Marlon Jensen by phone and by email. Elder Holland by phone and by email as well. Do you know what they tell me? They say, we don't have answers for any of this. You're right, Brother Real. There are serious questions in our history. We're working to put out a better history. But the trouble is they're doing it in a way that you're not even knowing it's happening. And it feels very deceptive. In talking with all of these folk, um, it becomes easy for people in a room like this to say, yeah, Brother Real is just saying in time one and stuff. That's not true. And again, I don't want you to take my word for it. I'd ask you to go read. I'd ask you to challenge yourselves and to look into what you believe and, and just open up just the smallest space in your mind to say, I wonder if the story I was taught isn't the truth. And if you're willing to do that, like the information out there, Richard Bushman recently wrote Rough Stone Rolling. Uh, it's a Deseret book. You can read Patrick Mason Planton. You can read uh, a book by Terrell Givens who go into deeper history. And they all, I've talked to these men. Each one of them goes, yeah, it's way worse than the church lets on. It's way more complicated than the church lets on. And we're having a lot less um, truth in the stories we tell than, than what the church lets on. 
in November. So I tried to make it work. As I knew this history, I also said like, ah, I, I'm just not gonna let the history bother me because these are good people and we're having, we're having positive experiences serving each other and we're making a difference in the world. And then in November, 2015, we enacted a policy which not only said that disciplinary courts were mandatory for those who were in homosexual marriages, which by the way, the church now acknowledges that being gay is not a choice. We all grew up with Spencer W. Kimball's uh, The Miracle of Forgiveness, which taught us that masturbation makes us homosexual, which if we're honest, brethren, that means all of us would probably have an issue with homosexuality, right? So we try to say that masturbation led to it. Spencer W. Kimball taught that not having a father in the home led to homosexuality. Spencer W. Kimball taught that having a dominant mother led to homosexuality. And the church now acknowledges none of that's true. The church admits that being gay is not a choice. And in November of 2015, the church came out with a policy that uh, not only made mandatory a disciplinary court for homosexual marriage, but prevented the children in that family from receiving the saving ordinances of the church, including the Holy Ghost. So on one hand, we like to say our teenagers, they need the Holy Ghost. They need it to get through school. They need it as a tool and a resource. But then on the other hand, we say, but yeah, those kids don't need it. Those kids don't need it. That's not fair. That's not right. By the way, uh, Utah has the highest suicide rate in our country. You don't think that has anything to do with Mormonism, if you're honest with yourselves? You don't think there's a drop of our shaming and marginalizing our kids who are gay? Imagine being a gay kid in this ward. Imagine being a gay kid in this state. You think they feel good about themselves? You think they see an opportunity to enjoy a happy and wholesome life? If I ask each of you to be celibate for the rest of your lives, intentionally, don't hold hands, don't go on a date, don't kiss anybody, how many of you would sign up for that? And you see, our leaders, our prophet, when they get, when their wife dies, Elder Oaks, Elder Nelson, they remarry again. Why? Because they're lonely. They check all the boxes. They don't need to remarry again, but they remarry again. Why? Because they're lonely. And yet we have people who are LGBT who can't, they didn't choose that. We now know the science. If a ring, if a one finger is longer than the other, you have a statistically higher chance of being gay. If you are the fourth son in a family rather than the second, you have a statistically higher chance of being gay. The church acknowledges that. And yet we still hold these beliefs that these people are broken. They need fixed somehow. And they're just human. It's no different than being left-handed. It's natural. And I know we want to like, well, out hell is not. That's not the reality. The science says so. And with the highest suicide rate, specifically between 11 and 17 year olds, there are gay kids hanging themselves from their parents' rafters. There are gay kids putting guns in their mouths and pulling triggers because they don't feel loved in this church. I've seen these. I know these kids. I've talked, I've talked to their parents. I've talked to transgender kids who are on the brink of suicide when someone like me who understood the issues took them aside and lifted them up and took them in and told them, don't worry about that. You're loved. Don't listen to what those people tell you. You're loved. There are people deeply hurting where they discover this doesn't fit for their gay um, women in the church often feel this way as well. So the suicide rate is not only the highest, it's also the fastest growing in the nation too. And we like to say it's the elevation, but we don't care that Colorado has got some mountains. We don't have a good excuse. We don't have a good reason for this. Children and sex abuse. Sam Young, who's outside right now on the other side of the building, was just recently excommunicated. He also served as a bishop. He was recently excommunicated for asking the church to change its policies around youth interviews. Utah is one of the highest states in sex abuse too, by the way. Do we know that? I'm sure that has no connection to Mormonism either. Now think about this. We're one of the few religions left in the world today who permits one-on-one -on -one interviews between an adult and a child behind closed doors. Man. We are one of even fewer religious systems that then proceeds to ask children questions of a sexual nature. If I went around the room and asked each person, how many of you were asked by your bishop if you masturbated? And if you came to your bishop with some sort of sexual sin, I would love to ask each one of you if you'd been asked questions that you thought, wow, that was a little inappropriate. He asked me circumstances and context that wasn't necessary. That's what happens at a church when you also have lay untrained leaders who have interviews behind closed doors and are permitted to ask sexual questions. You see, 
to be a bishop, you could be a plumber or an electrician, or in my case, a carpet salesman. And you can sit with 12-year-olds or even seven-year-olds as you prepare them for baptism. And you're told, whatever the Spirit asks you to ask, go for it. And so you can ask anything. And some leaders, because we created a space, some leaders end up abusing these kids or harming them or causing trauma to them by asking things they shouldn't. So not only are we one of the very few churches left on the earth right now who ask questions behind closed doors with a stranger, essentially, and a child, we also have an untrained leadership. We don't learn boundaries. We don't learn ethics. We don't learn what causes more pain when we ask it, when we think we're helping. We don't realize that when we talk to a young kid and teach them Mormonism and teach them that this kind of a boundary is safe, and now they go out into the world and they think these one-on-one -on -one conversations with a man behind closed doors is safe. Do your daughters go to BYU and they let this RM come home and they think they're safe in his presence because he's a priesthood holder and they've been taught their whole lives to trust in these situations. And what we've done is we've created very unsafe boundaries where abuse happens. What about those who have doubt and questions? You see, Marlon Jensen and Terrell Givens both said, we are losing our brightest, our best and brightest. The folks who are leaving the church over doubts and questions are the people who read, who are willing to critically think, who are willing to question things. They're willing to say, what if what I was taught wasn't true? My gut tells me, and again, I can't prove it, it's all anecdotal. For every hundred people who dive into the messiness that's Mormonism's history and its policy and doctrines, my gut tells me about 95% of those end up outside the church at some point. Why? What do we do with people who have questions? We shame them. We tell them there's not safe places to ask those questions. We push back against them. We tell them the things they're sharing are anti-Mormon propaganda. It's not true. It's the facts of our history. We're going to have to come to grips with it. Some members could care less about history or truth claims, but for those who care and who are willing to get uncomfortable, it is almost always falls apart for them. No. I would challenge you when this is over, instead of walking to your cars and going home, those are good people on the other side of the building. Go walk up and shake their hand and ask them their story. Give, give yourself 10 minutes to ask two of them and tell you your, their story. They cared. It wasn't that Satan came in and they got lazy and they wanted to sit and they just wanted to drink. That's not what happened. They read Mormonism's history outside of the correlated material and it fell apart. And so they took back their lives and they chose to live their lives a different way now. They do that. There's donuts over there, cider. There's hot chocolate. They'll be nice. They'll smile at you and they'll shake your hand. Ask their story. Ask why it fell apart for them. Because their story is my story. In our church, we tell lots of stories. We badmouth Simon's writer for leaving because his name was spelled wrong, when that isn't why he left, by the way. We badmouth Thomas Marsh for leaving over milk and strippings, even though that's not historically accurate either. We badmouth the three witnesses for their crime out of the church, and we failed to discuss what they've actually written down about why they left and what was going on in the church. We badmouth William Law and William McClellan. We claim the Nauvoo expositor was just spreading lies. None of those stories that we tell in our manuals about those things and a hundred other are true. When we go to the source material, we find out that the stories we tell aren't historically accurate. Even in the present tense, we excommunicated D. Michael Quinn in 1992 for telling the factual history. We now quote him in our gospel topic essays and refer people in the footnotes to his books that he was excommunicated over. We excommunicate John DeLynn, who is out in the back as well, for acknowledging that this history doesn't add up. We excommunicated Kit Kelly for questioning our patriarchy and simply asking our leaders if they would ask God if women could have a larger role in the church. We excommunicated Sam Young for asking us to reconsider our youth interviews and the dangerous boundaries that take place in us. And now, my gut tells me you're going to excommunicate me for shining a light on the, all of that, that our history doesn't match up, and that we treat people in very unhealthy ways. And I've also been honest about the dishonesty of our leaders. By the way, we don't have one healthy story of someone who's left our church. 
go search the primary manual. Go search uh, James E. Talmadge Articles of Faith or church, search Gordon B. Heath, the disparate story. Search any of our curriculum. We don't have a healthy story of anybody who's left. We don't let people leave with their dignity. We don't let people leave when they came to an honest, sincere conclusion that none of this added up. We treat them horribly. Every story we tell says they're broken, they're tears among the wheat, they're the chafe, they've fallen, they've apostatized. We don't have a single healthy story about people who leave. When someone comes into the church having left some other religious system, how courageous are they? How brave are they? When someone has a seeker of truth, deconstructs Mormonism, and says, it just wasn't true, and I had to go out. What do we do? We turn our backs on them, and we treat them like they're broken and less than. There is no healthy space in Mormonism to ask questions. Elder Oak says questions are honored, but try it. Try walking into a Sunday school and raising your hand and saying, that story we just told isn't true. When you know the story isn't true, and everybody in the room doesn't know. <laughs> Some of the stories, by the way, um, I'll show in a moment. My communication with leaders, again, I've talked to Elder Holland, I've talked to Marla Jensen, I've talked to the scholars, every one of them admits our history is not accurate. We're working on it, but we don't want to talk about it. It's got to stay under, we can't, it has to stay hidden, we can't talk about it. So those changes will occur, but it can't be out in the open. Yeah. Thank you. I'm here today because of my criticizing leaders for being dishonest. Elder Ballard says we haven't hidden anything. I hope on just some little degree, you can acknowledge that for what I've shared to you today, if what I said is true, we have hidden some things. Um, Stephen Snow, who was the church historian, said we need to be more transparent. He said, in the past, we used to withhold things. We used to not share as much, and we need to be more transparent. If we say that in another way, it means we need to stop hiding things. We need to start talking in the open. So when Elder Ballard says we haven't hit anything, that's not honest. That's not truthful. Elder Ballard is being dishonest because he does know the history. He's talked about, we need to build a gospel topic essay. He talked about how he's read it. He does know these issues, but he doesn't want to acknowledge that we haven't been forthright with you guys. You guys received a story that doesn't hold up to the data. It doesn't hold up to the facts. Joseph Smith lied about polygamy. We know this. He kept it from Emma. That's a sin of omission. He told the public he wasn't practicing polygamy while he was. That's a lie of commission. No matter how we spin it, that's a lie. So to say our leaders don't lie isn't true. Joseph Billy Smith cutting out the 1832 First Vision account, that's dishonest. He didn't want us to see it because he himself understood it was a peculiar, his own words, a peculiar First Vision account. Brigham Young continued to blame the Native Americans for the Mountain Meadows Massacre long after he knew it was his own people. Wilford Woodruff gave the 1890 Manifesto acting as if the church was stopping polygamy, but guess what? He continued to authorize polygamous marriages underground. That's dishonest. We could justify it, maybe. We could say he had to. It was for the good of the church, but it still was a lie. In 1984, Ronald Pullman, the, the gentleman in this room who are a little older, I'm sure you recognize that name. He was a member of the 70. He gave a conference talk in 1984, gave the talk. It was a talk about leaning more as you grow in the gospel on yourself and less on the church, when the talk was over, they had him re-give the talk in an empty conference center, then put a cough track in the background, and then put that on your VHS tape that you got the general conference. So if you happen to remember in 1984, thought you, hit, you thought you heard Ronald Pullman give one talk in conference, and then put your VHS tape in and heard a second talk, and you thought, wow, that's not the way I remember it. That's true. It wasn't the way you remember it. It was very different. And so the church had him re-give the talk with a cough track in the background, and they said nothing about it. So now you can go on YouTube, and you can type in Ronald Pullman, and you can see both videos side by side with each other, and you can see that they are completely different. 
Okay. Here's what Elder Stephen Snow said exactly. He said, my view is that being open about our history solves a whole lot more problems than it creates. You see that? We might not have all the answers, but if we are open and we now have pretty remarkable transparency, which means we then didn't, then I think in the long run that will serve us well. I think in the past there was a tendency to keep a lot of the records closed or at least not give access to information. Elder Ballard said we haven't hid anything. And so when I put liar, as harsh as you think that is, the reality is next to the church historian of our church, a general authority, that liar stamp is true. He said, but the world has changed in the last generation. What's changed? It's the information age. It's the internet. With access to information on the internet, Stephen Snow says we can't continue that pattern. I think we need to continue to be more open. In other words, there's still things they're not telling you. Yes, our leaders are dishonest. If you can't call them out as dishonest. The thing with Elmer Holland, I did a podcast episode titled Liar, Liar, Pants on Fire. It's cute. It is harsh. But I show five times using Elder Holland's own audio, juxtaposed against the actual data that shows that he is in fact lying. So you can, again, say my tone isn't okay. You can say I'm being too harsh. But the reality is he did lie on five occasions. The guy has a problem with honesty. And this is a guy who I considered a friend who reached out to me. The attached letter was received in my office a little over a week ago. Title, this is to Marlon K. Jensen from Elder Jeffrey R. Holland. Uh, while I was on assignment in Africa, would you be good enough to handle, as you feel appropriate, this letter from Bishop William J. Real, who is currently serving as a bishop of the Sandusky, Ohio Ward? Please express to him my love and best wishes. Tell him I would respond personally were it not for other demands, including a grueling trip to Africa. I'm concerned about such people. I've spoken to Elmer Holland. I considered him a friend. And yet I also put my foot down and say he did lie. But should I be punished for telling the truth? Should I be punished about talking about our messy history? Should I be punished for telling a leader and saying that guy is lying when the data imposes that he did? The issue is not about the lies, though. Sadly, it's whether anyone like me is allowed to shine a light on them. If that light imposes that we each get really uncomfortable and our religion must come face to face with its unhealthiness. But stories in our church that aren't true, by the way. Brigham Young's transfiguration. The two first witnesses to that weren't even in town the day it happened. John D. Lee, Orson Hyde. Both of them in their journals say they weren't in town. They're the first two guys to tell us that that transfiguration occurred. The Sweetwater Crossing. But we'll talk about these three 18-year-old boys. They weren't 18. There were more than three. And they died so long after. And yet we try to tell a story that they died so soon after. And bring them young, promise they'd be in the selected kingdom. That's not true. The seagulls and crickets. Seagulls eat crickets all the time. And how Brigham Young took control of the church? I would challenge each of you to go home tonight and do some serious research on how Brigham Young took control of the church. It's not the story we were told. No, and by the way, nobody along the way has ever accused me of lying or fabricating these details. And when I share them with anybody in the church, including apostles and church historians, they admit that what I'm telling is the truth. Only that it's unacceptable to say it. It's unacceptable to share the truth. I have, through this entire process, maintained integrity, vulnerability, and authenticity. I have only spoken the truth. So, President, I recognize that everyone in this room, their responsibility is to make sure the procedures are fired. It's your job to decide whether I'm an apostate or not. Tonight, you get to decide whether seeking and also telling the truth are acceptable endeavors in Mormonism. You get to decide whether the facts matter or whether we simply need to protect a story in authorities, no matter how harmful or dishonest that story or those authorities are. Brethren, tonight, you may have thought it was me that was on trial, but it was never me. It's the church that's on trial. It's its integrity. It's its honesty. It's the church that's on trial, and in part, each of you is you sit in judgment of me. That's all I've got to say. So, as you read, in my head, but the doctor, yeah, he didn't nodded. They think that to say that. Well, it's sort of a mental. Elon's sister, and he didn't do that. 
So I, he said, I'll like train to this. He did better than the full story ever. And I think he wanted to show about it. And I see that's what he did. He learned about it. So and when he found out that it just did not add up, he was alone. He didn't even tell me for a while. And he didn't tell me because he heard of the story of where marriages crumbled. Divorce is not in. Families are now broken. There's, we get so many messages and visits about how he's helped keep the foot ruined with their marriages or help them feel not alone, help them feel like they're not crazy. He validated them. Time and time again, we get these messages. Just out here tonight, a young lady said, Bill, back in February, I was on a breakup divorce. And thanks to you, I, my marriage is safe. And we're happy. And we're together. We get these all the time. And so now because Bill has only sought out truth and knowledge, my eternal marriage, my way back to the celestial kingdom, it's on the line. Not because he wants to sin or that he has sinned, because he wanted truth and search for knowledge. I've not done anything that's immoral. I'm not here because I'm caught in adultery. I'm not here because I did some kind of immoral sin. I'm here because I told the truth, and we're not really supposed to talk about that here. So now we see what you guys do. Now we see if you're willing to accept the fact that this gets really messy. Then are you willing to let somebody stay among you who knows it, who knows it doesn't add up, and who can point you to the very sources that determine that this isn't what it claims to be? That doesn't mean it's true or not true. It just means that we framed it in a way to be faith promoting, and that doesn't hold up. So if apostles have lied, can you excommunicate a guy who shines a light on their line? That would seem like that would be a lack of integrity on your and the church's part, not mine. So let's see what happened. I'm done.